Good evening and uh, welcome to Squawk Talk on Socialist Telly. I'm delighted to welcome uh, on the programme this evening Manuel Cortez from the TSSA, Transport Union, and uh, he's going to talk to us about what's going on in the transport sector at the moment, uh, particularly with regard to the way that it's been affected by the pandemic. Uh, Manuel, good evening. Um, tell me what's what's happening, what's the latest news in terms of the, uh, the impact on the travel industry and uh, your members uh, of what's going on in the pandemic and the way the government's handling it? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that our members have been heroes, absolute heroes. They have kept the country moving. They have kept vital freight moving during the pandemic. And of course, our big worry going forward are twofold. The first is that our members need to be vaccinated. Those people on the front line who are coming into work through thick and thin, who have come into work every day since the pandemic, we believe that once the first crunch of the most vulnerable people have been vaccinated, that they should be next in line. And I've written to the transport secretary about this. I've written to the devolved governments about this because I think it's really important that there is a recognition that our work, that our members are putting their lives on the, on the line every day of the week. The other problem that we face is that, you know, home working was a growing trend, but the pandemic has put rocket, rocket boosters underneath and you know passenger numbers have plummeted particularly at the moment we're in the lockdown in England and mo most of Britain uh, we're in the lockdown so numbers are, are really low but no one expects that there will be a full recovery and what we don't need what we really don't need is for railway lines to be shut and we don't need train stations to be shut you know our railways are a vital component to getting decarbonization right we need to keep investing in them I would argue very strongly that we actually have to expand the network and connect many towns that haven't had a, a railway line since the beaching days. And of course, through electrification, we actually can run a very clean, very green railway. But I fear that with the Tories in power, if there is a drop in the revenue box, which looks very likely that the outcome of that will be cuts, cuts to services and cuts to the infrastructure of a railway. And we have to fight to ensure that that doesn't happen. And you mentioned uh, at the beginning of that, that that you've been writing to government ministers, etc. I mean, what kind of response have you had from the Westminster government in terms of uh, you raising your concerns? We've had very, very polite replies, but not saying very much, if, if I'm brutally honest. The Transport Secretary told us that he was considering whether or not rail workers should be in the next tranche of vaccination. I haven't heard since... It's a couple of weeks ago since he told me that, and I haven't heard back. But no doubt we will be pursuing that angle, and we will continue to do so until our members, who, have, as I said, have been heroes throughout the pandemic, those people on the front line going into work day in, day out, risking their lives until those people are fully protected, and that means they're vaccinated. Well, we've just seen new statistics uh, come out this morning from the Office for National Statistics, uh, which um, in total say that... Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's several hundred people, at least in the in the transport uh, industry, have been uh, killed by the virus since the pandemic started. Uh, obviously, we had the very famous case uh, a few months ago of Benny Majinga, who died after the um, passenger uh, allegedly spat at her and, uh, and, and claimed he was infected. Um, do you believe that the government is taking seriously what's going on there? The, the, the way that the, the statistics are being presented is quite misleading because if you look at the headline numbers, you would think that the numbers were about a third of, as high as they really are. And it's only for people who dig down uh, that you really get to see what's going on in terms of the impact on, on people like your members. Um, are, the, are the government taking it seriously? Do you think they're really uh, cognizant and um, respectful of the danger that your members go into each day? Well, look, I don't believe any statistics this government puts out because they always try and skew them in their favour. The reality is that the trade unions have done a lot of good work with employers to try and make us, our railways in particular, as safe as we possibly can in the middle of the pandemic. Clearly, you know, we've now got a solution how people can be protected, and that is to be vaccinated. And that's why we are pushing extremely hard for this to become the norm. And that's, as I said to you only a few minutes ago, why our union is pushing for transport workers on the front line to be given the vaccine as soon as possible. I will not rest 
until that vaccine is made available to all those frontline transport workers. Uh, I mean, you, meant, you raise an interesting issue there that you, you had to be talking to employers in the plural. Um, we have a privatised rail system largely. And uh, it means that your job, I guess, is much more complicated because you have to not only talk to the government about those issues, but also then with individual employers. Um, would it be would, would we be in a better situation in the pandemic if we had a nationalised rail system that was run uh, by the state? Well, you don't have to convince me or our <laughs> members of the need to have a nationalised railway. It's actually been uh, the policy of our union all the way back to 1921. We had to fight very hard until we got it nationalised under a Labour government back in 1948. Sadly, the Tories in a vandalic act sold them off and we are still fighting to bring them back into public ownership again. But, you, but you're absolutely right. It makes no sense to run a vital part of our country's infrastructure, a really important part of our transport network for it to be run for profit. It really should be run in the public industry, interest. And that means under public ownership. Yes, I mean, I'd go so far as to say it's even a national, as we've seen in the pandemic now, it's a national security issue because if you have Absolutely. a fragmented uh, fragmented system with each individual company making its own decisions and its own arrangements, um, then the, you know, it leaves a lot more room for there to be holes in the system, for there to be problems, uh, difficulties and you know, dangers of transmission, etc., that could otherwise be avoided if everything was joined up. You know what's scandalous is that you know, passengers have rightly kept away from the transport network to, to enable essential workers to use it so that healthcare workers can get to our hospitals, so that care workers can get to our homes, so that we can move vital freight as well through the network. But I tell you what, it's a scandal of the private train operators, even though they're making no profit, the government is still giving them money so they can pay dividends to their shareholders. That is just ridiculous in the middle of a national emergency. And that's why privatization did not work prior to the pandemic, and it will definitely not work after we've conquered the virus. Yes. Now, you, you mentioned briefly at the beginning there the, um, the climate issues, and obviously you know, nobody would be surprised if the government uses this uh, crisis as a, an opportunity to slash back the public transport network, uh, which goes directly against what they're supposed to be doing on climate targets, et cetera. But in, in what way would it help the climate uh, and, and achieving the decarbonisation targets if we were to, as you said, extend the rail, rail network and drive more freight uh, onto the rail system? Well, look, you cannot decarbonise without having a very good public transport system. And the railway must be central to that. One of the things we should be doing, because in comparison to other European countries, not enough of a network is electrified. We should be increasing electrification. That means that we can, when we produce electricity from clean, from clean energy, it means that there are no carbon emissions relating to that. In addition, we know that our roads are badly congested. So taking freight over roads and into rail is a win-win situation. You know, there is not a more environmentally friendly way to move people and or freight than to move them on our railways. And when you look at, for example, Eurostar that at the moment is really struggling because the Tories sold the stake we had in that company. When Osborne was Chancellor, in a vandalic act, he sold a stake in the company. And that means that at the moment that company is owned by the government of France, by the government of Belgium, and by, some, and by some privateers to whom the Tories sold our stake. We are very clear that this asset needs to be protected. It provides the greenest link that we have to the continent. And as a result of that, what we should be doing now is stepping in, rescuing the company, ensuring it doesn't go bankrupt. But in return for that, we should be getting our stake back within the company. And would the um, massive queues that we've seen at, the, at, at Dover, et cetera, with the issues with the, uh, with the borders, would that be alleviated as well? Um, would, the, would the rail uh, freight be able to go through more easily than uh, with it, without all the big delays at the, uh, at the coast? Well, yes, but I think that the problems we've got at the borders are ones that the Tory government has created who promise mm -hmm. that we were going to have friction, frictionless access to European markets and vice versa. And clearly it was a big fat line. They've not been able to deliver that. And now we're starting to see the consequences of that. But look, any freight we can move on to rail, whether it's for domestic purposes or to shift to the continent, 
must be must be a far more environmentally way of moving freight than through our road network. The RMT union has said today that, that the numbers of, of cases and deaths among uh, rail staff has, has doubled uh, just in the last couple of months. Uh, so somebody's not giving us the full story. What, what, what's your, what are you hearing back from the front line in terms of uh, how it's impacting your members? I mean, what I'm hearing back from the front line is that there has been a number of fatalities I mean, and clearly that the situation has got worse m- most recently. But then, you know, we know that the new strain of the, of the virus is far more lethal than the previous one and it's been spreading far quicker. Clearly, my job as a, as, a, as a union leader is to ensure that those members who have to go into work, to ensure that we can get health workers to our hospitals, that we can get care workers to our homes, that they are protected as best as possible. And of course, any spikes in deaths is a worrying trend and one that as a union, we will be seeking assurances that it can be abated and hopefully very soon halted to the vaccination of all workers on the front line of our rail industry. The official story from the government is, you know, is about the uh, increase in transmissibility of the virus and, and supposedly now that it's uh, 30% more deadly. Um, but actually, if you look at the evidence in, in other countries which have had the, uh, the so-called UK strain of the virus for British. pretty much as long, um, they are actually reducing their, and have been for, for weeks and weeks, uh, reducing their numbers of cases and their numbers of deaths. Uh, if you look at Italy, for example, their death rate at the moment is about a third of ours, but they've had the, uh, the new strain of the virus there since at least the beginning of December and, and probably before that. Um, it looks on closer analysis, pretty much like an excuse from the government to uh, try and avoid the blame for the fact that they haven't done the things that they should have done soon enough, uh, or at all in some cases, uh, and, and they want to blame it on this supposed new super strain of the virus rather than um, give it, uh, you know, they hold their hands up and say, yes, we got it wrong and we need to do better. I mean, what, what failings have you seen from the government in the way that, you know, I've criticised them a lot for not closing schools soon enough, in terms of how they've reacted on transport, what specific failings have they uh, have they committed there? Well, I mean, I think one of the biggest failings is that we our borders were open throughout throughout months and months on end, where people could come in with different strains, and there was no checks, there was no need to have taken a test, there was there was nothing. People were just allowed in. I think I read in one of the newspapers millions of people came into a country. Even, even though we were in a very strict lockdown back, back, uh, back in March last year, people, the borders were absolutely open. Look, th- there has to be a day of reckoning over this virus. You know, we are heading towards 100,000 people who are dead. There is no doubt that the government has not handled this pandemic well. They've botched it. They've botched it at every turn. And, you know, now there's a big debate whether or not the government is following the correct advice when it comes even to vaccinating us. Be- between you know the gap between the first dose and the second dose, clearly, clearly they claimed that they were going to be led by the science. Well, they clearly haven't done that. And I called and I called for this very early on that there needs to be a public inquiry into the way that the government has handled this pandemic because, in my view, they've made a complete mess of it. And sadly, there's people dead that would otherwise be alive had they not made such a mess of it. Yes. Well, back in the in the long ago days, and they do seem a long time ago now, when uh, the UK's uh, number of cases and number of deaths was in double figures rather than four figures, um, we had less of an issue with the virus here than places like Italy and Spain uh, and, and cities like New York. And yet, during the lockdown, as you mentioned, you know, passengers were allowed to fly in from those places which had far higher uh, levels of the virus without any checks whatsoever, with no kind of effective quarantine. Even now, when the government's claiming that it's doing something about it, it's still operating essentially a, an honour system in terms of people being required to self-isolate, but it's not doing what a country like New Zealand did, where, you know, or if you arrive in Australia uh, from, out, you know, from, from somewhere that's got the virus, you have to go into a proper quarantine centre for two weeks. You don't get to sit at home and it's up to you whether you pop out to the shops you, you, you're essentially locked up in, in somewhere for a couple of weeks while they make sure that you're not infected before you're allowed to mix with the general population so at the point when we weren't the uh 
worst hit place in the world pretty much in terms of the virus. We were um, importing it from other places at the same time as British citizens were, were in lockdown and kept off the transport networks. Um, I think you're absolutely right on that point, but uh, you know they're still not acting as they should be and they're still actually propagating the problem rather than getting on top of it. Well, look, if I was to summarize how the government has dealt with the pandemic, it's been far too little, far, far too late. The reality is they started off with this notion of herd immunity. They, they, they moved on from that, but at every step of the way, they have been behind the curve. They have been well behind the curve. The reason that a lot of people aren't as aware of that as they should be has been the handling of the, uh, the information during the pandemic by the uh, mainstream media, for want of a better term. Um, they've allowed the government still to claim that it's doing well, that it's world beating, that it's all these other things that, that they like to boast about and to hive off the, uh, the blame to, you know, for example, with this latest thing where they're claiming that it's the super strain is the problem. Um, nobody in the media has really pointed out to them the situations in places like Italy uh, that have, have done much better despite the presence of the new strain there. Um, do the transport workers get a fair crack of the whip, a fair shake from, from the media? How are they treated? Well, look, let, let's be honest. I'm a trade unionist and I'm a socialist. The, the media has never, never, ever really protected us in a good light. You know, you only hear about trade unions when we are fighting the bosses, mostly when they behave not very reasonably. That's when people fight. You know, it's very hard to get people out on strike or, or very hard to get people to take any action. Most people want to go to work. They want to be treated with respect. They want to be looked after and they want to make sure that they can get a good day's wage for a good day's work. But of course, that's not the situation that many people find themselves when they are at work. And clearly unions are here to, to protect them. That's what we do. We, we bring people together collectively. We act. But, you know, the idea that we are portrayed in, in a good light by the media, by the mainstream media, is not. Well, you know, it's not true. We never have been. <laughs> yes. I mean, you, you look at the way they talk about union leaders. We're all elected. We're all accountable. But it's the, you know, the trade union barons. Like we've descended from some kind of hereditary, from some kind of hereditary dynasty. We were actually yes. elected. You know, overwhelmingly, all, all union officials are ordinary, ordinary working men and women who have been elected by their peers to ensure that working people can get a better law. But that's not the way we are, we are projected in the media. Yes, union paymasters is the other, uh, other yes, very popular. That's the other one, yes. And yet union money is actually, you know, in my opinion, the cleanest money in politics in this, uh, in this country because it's raised by members, it's accountable. The people uh, handing it out to the Labour Party, if they do, are accountable to the members for how they spend it. Um, it's, it's all got to be fully transparent, and yet, you know, the political donations that come from millionaires and billionaires into the Tory party, for example, uh, are not, uh, you know, are far from as transparent. And, you know, we've seen scandals of people, you know, rich people giving money to other people to donate to their favourite courses to get around the, uh, to get around the rules on political donations and declarations, etc. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's, the unions are actually, the, at the moment, probably the essential um, tool for the for, for working people to be able to get anywhere in this country because I don't think there's a there's a massive amount of, of direct opposition going on in, in in Westminster. But you mentioned about fair days work for a fair days pay. Um, we've seen you know one transport company, although not in your uh, particular sector with the British Airways and also British Gas, um, trying to use this fire and rehire um, tactic to drive down wages now and using the pandemic as an excuse for why they need to do it. Are, are we seeing that from any of the transport companies your members are working in? No, thankfully, no, not so far. But I tell you what, in a civilised country, in the 21st century, higher, refire and higher should just be outlawed. It should not be possible for bosses yes. to get away with that. In any fair society, the idea that you can fire someone to rehire them so that you can attack the terms and conditions should just be banned, full stop. It's just exploiting vulnerable workers. And, you know, as I said, any, any country, any country in the 21st century that aspires to be a, a fair society would not, allow, would not allow this kind of things to go on. 
They should just they just need to be banned. Full stop. Very good. Um, if you wanted to get anything across to your members in the last five minutes of the show, um, what message would you like to get across to people that that, that are members of the TSSA or, or aren't members of the TSSA but are, are working in relevant sectors uh, about how they can, uh, you know, what they can do in the pandemic to stand up for themselves and, and for their rights? Well, the first thing that we want to do is to thank them for their heroic efforts during the pandemic to keep people afraid moving. So that will be the first thing we want to do. The second one is to ask them if they're not yet a member of our TSSA family to join our union, because that's the best way that workers can get protection. Everybody should be in a trade union, whether you work in our sector or in any other sector of the economy, because by standing together, standing shoulder to shoulder with each other, we can achieve justice in the workplace. And of course, to those who are our members, my most important message to them is that our union is fighting, fighting as hard as we can to ensure that they are protected during the pandemic and that I will not rest as General Secretary until we have every single one of them who wants to be vaccinated, vaccinated against this terrible virus. Very good. Manuel, thank you ever so much for your time. Really appreciated you coming on. And thank uh, you for you're having welcome me. Back in. Welcome back anytime again, and I'll join you there in paying tribute to your uh, members who are out there on the front line, putting their lives on the line every day to, to keep the country moving. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for having me. And now for the next part of our show, I'm very happy to uh, welcome Paul O'Connell, who is a teacher of law in uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies University uh, in London, but also it was a campaigner for um, Brexit from the socialist point of view and uh, is involved in political education as well. Paul, thank you very much for coming on the programme. Thanks for having me on. Um, so you campaigned for Brexit um, in the run-up to the, the referendum. Tell us a little bit about how you saw that uh, from, a, from a left point of view, because uh, you know the majority of members of the Labour Party, at least, have, were, were Remainers. Yeah. Um, I voted Remain, um, and, and I'd probably go the other way now, just on principle, if uh, yeah. <laughs> if it had ever come to another referendum, because I got tired of hearing people trying to uh, disrespect working class voices of you know working class folks that, yeah. that had decided they wanted to leave. Um, but I think it'd be interesting for people to uh, hear, you know, our, our left our left winger um, like Jeremy Corbyn in his time yeah. and uh, Tony Benn and people like that uh, would would see the European Union as a problem that we we would be better getting out of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all, so I think the first thing I'd say about the whole Brexit process is I wish it never happened. I mean, that would be the first thing I'd say. I mean, before before Cameron and his arrogance called the referendum in order to settle the sort of arguments within the Tory party, we were all wrapped up, I'm sure, myself as well, in anti-austerity campaigns and trying to build our trade unions in the workplaces and, and sort of anti-racism campaigns. Um, so the last thing we needed was this debate. But the thing was, once once it was called and once the question was posed, then my view was from then and still is now that as socialists you had to approach it from a socialist perspective and that meant then understanding what the question was and the question was should we leave the European Union and all the context that came with that so first and foremost you look at the EU well what what is the EU and how does it relate to socialism and you mentioned Tony Benn and Jeremy Corbyn you could throw Bob Crow in there as well you pretty much throw every prominent socialist in Britain for the last 40 years in there where the Eurosceptic position was the dominant position and it was the dominant position not for the same reasons that Farage and people like that opposed the EU it was a dominant position because we've always understood that the EU is a project of European capital that the EU is designed to protect the interests of capitalists and to benefit them at the expense of workers primarily and that's how it works and you look at what's happened in general over the last 20 years especially since the Maastricht Treaty but even more so since the crisis started in 2007 and 2008 the EU has constitutionalized the principles of neoliberalism. So competition, uh, rolling back the state in, in key respects, uh, putting downward pressure on workers' rights, granting increased rights to corporations. There were two famous cases that probably some people would have heard of, the Viking and Laval cases, where the European Court of Justice held that the rights of companies took priority over workers across the EU in specific contexts. Um, you know, pe many people knew the example of Greece, but also Ireland suffered 
uh, immensely under austerity in the context of EU membership, as did Spain, Italy. Even at the start of this pandemic, when the Italian state was trying to mobilise resources to meet the demands of the pandemic, the EU initially was placing restrictions on what they could do because of state aid rules and so forth. And they finally relaxed them, but the default position is to undermine it. So but that all those problems are there within the EU. And then more fundamentally, the EU has been designed to be democratically inaccessible. So you can't really change this. I mean, this is one of the things people often said, remain and reform and so forth. And I teach, I have taught for years, British public law and also EU law. And the only way you could say remain and reform with a straight face is if you didn't know the EU, if you didn't know how it worked. If you actually understand the constitutional mechanisms and the architecture of it, if you understood the balance of political forces across Europe, it wasn't, it's not a, it's not a possibility. It's not a realistic possibility. So my view was that even though it was uh, a world away from ideal and it wasn't the fight we would have chosen to have in 2016, it was there in front of us. And so as socialists, you had to respond to that. Now, I think it's linked to Corbyn in important ways. And I see, and, and I've sort of argued this and written this a few times, that Corbyn and the Brexit vote were two sides of the same coin. Uh, it was working people in Britain and, and other sectors of the, of, the, of the British society, but working people in Britain who had experienced... 20 years of decline in real wages, who had just gone through the best part of 10 years of Tory austerity, who were living in sort of conditions of job insecurity, un unaffordable housing, unstable housing, and people were looking for an alternative. And on the one hand, the Brexit vote was a, a big sort of finger to the entire establishment, but so was the Corbyn project. The whole Corbyn thing was people going, hang on a minute, we have to do something different. Now, of course, all, everybody involved with that will know that there were large sections of the Labour Party, in particular the PLP and the Labour bureaucracy, who fought to nail against that and fought to nail against any sort of changes. But these two things were part of a historical moment. You know, we were in a, in a period of crisis. The whole capitalist system was in crisis. And these were two elements of that, man how they manifested in Britain. So my view was, and it remains, that what socialists had to do then was make the arguments as to why we should want to leave the European Union, but to do it in a socialist way, not to do it to sort of, you know, get back to good old Britain and flat caps and all this nonsense, right? But to say, right, we'll build an anti-racist, anti-austerity uh, pro jobs, pro pro sort of intervention movement that will say to people, right, we're going to use the state, we're going to win over the state through the Corbyn project, and we're going to mobilize the state to build uh, green energy, massive investment in green energy, create thousands of apprenticeships and jobs. We're going to uh, completely transform the housing sector. We're going to create regional investment banks and sort of do that 11 and up that the Tories now say they'll do. So my view is that we had to do that. And my view from the start was that you couldn't for example, as Corbyn tried to do, you couldn't try to ride both horses at once. You couldn't be claiming to be someone who's going to change the world. You know, you couldn't be saying, we'll turn everything upside down. And at the same time, be saying, yeah, but the EU is fine. Because Corbyn knew it wasn't. Corbyn's smart enough to know it's not. Anybody within the Labour Party who's studied the EU in any meaningful sense understands that that's not the case. And even more so when it came to the election. So, I helped set up the left campaign, uh, Leave, Fight, Transform, and where it was people in it who were from the Labour Party, people who weren't, people from Momentum, from the Communist Party, from Counterfire, from no groups, I'm not in any organisation, so people from that were independent. And a big part of what we were trying to do was fight a rearguard action against the people's vote, Keir Starmer, another Europe as possible mm. sort of influence that was pushing Labour towards this sort of soft remain position. And the reason we were doing that was one, because as a matter of political principle, Labour shouldn't have been trying to overturn the democratic vote once it had been decided. However, people voted in the, and I had friends who voted remain and that's, that's fine. But once the vote was taken, the position to overturn it was a reactionary position. No two ways about it. You can make up all the stories you want about Putin and uh, Cambridge Analytica and everything else. But fundamentally, a majority of people mobilised 17.4 million people, whatever it was, and voted to leave. Single biggest democratic mandate in British history. And to then be the party that says, yeah, we're not quite sure about that. And then they go into places, whether you go into South Shields, whether you go into East London, whether you go into Crewe and places like that, where people are living in poverty, have been living in deindustrialization. They say, we're going to do everything for you, free broadband, the whole bit. Now, that one thing we gave you to say on, we're not going to do that, but trust us and everything else. It wasn't going to wash, you know what I mean? Yes. And, and unfortunately, 
the yuppies, uh, Boris Johnson and that, they were smart enough to understand that. They portrayed themselves as being the anti-establishment ones. Yeah. <laughs> that right. Corbyn, Corbyn and all with the establishment and Johnson and all with the insurgent and the establishment that were going to get Brexit done. And they were always going to lose the election. There was no two ways about it. Um, the die was cast long before the election was called. And that's where we are now. So, yeah. I, don't know. I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I... I would be surprised if you disagree, but, but say if you do. But I mean, it was a manufactured position that as well, because yeah. Labour, you know, the whole Corbyn surge in 2017 was built on, you know, the kind of core principle apart from, you know, for the many, et cetera, was the idea that you would, um, you know, we would honour the referendum result yeah. and get a Brexit that worked for working people. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, if you look at the, you know, the Brexit deal we've ended up with, thanks to the people who pushed for a second referendum all the time. Oh, uh, is about as attractive as, as Nigel Farage pr prancing around in a mankini, you know, <laughs> <Nobody> with, <wants. laughs> even, even if he had a Brazilian wax. But, yeah. you know, the, um, the what could have been would have been very much different if yeah. we'd ended up with the Labour government negotiating, negotiating yeah. all that now. Absolutely. And, and pushing for, and you know, and as, as, as much, you know, and as much as I ever had any kind of lines into the, uh, into the movement, into the political movement at, at uh, Westminster level, I was begging people, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're going to, it's suicide this. If you uh, push for this referendum, you're going to lose the North. And if you lose the North, you, you, you're screwed. It's going to be Scotland Mark II, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, and sadly, other councils prevailed. And yeah, yeah. Uh, other viewpoints uh, managed to eventually, I think, manoeuvre Corbyn into a position where he felt he had no choice but to, you know, accept this waffly, you know, yeah. yes, we'll have a second referendum, but no, we won't necessarily campaign for it. Position. Um, what what could it have looked like? You know, if it had been done in a way that wasn't, you know, didn't like Johnson's deal does now. If it didn't bake in all of the worst parts of the uh, EU situation with none of the best bits, yeah. <laughs> uh, as it does now in terms of competition law and you know, yeah. fragmenting the NHS and all the other stuff that it does. You know, yeah. what 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 could a Labour government have done in outside the EU? So just very quickly, and I just to sort of agree with what you said there, and it's no coincidence that the people's vote, the actual campaign that was set up to push it, dissolved once Labour lost the election and Corbyn was gone. That that movement just disappeared because mm -hmm. it was an entire uh, <clears throat> infected movement uh, designed uh, in large part. And there is, there's definitely a section of the British uh, ruling class and a section of uh, Britain sort of middle classes who very actively would have preferred to remain for good reasons. Um, but the actual movement itself, the political campaign around it, was a wedge to undermine the Corbyn project. That and the sort of anti-Semitism smear campaign that was also manufactured. These were two wedges to undermine the Corbyn project. And in that since they were effective. Do you know what I mean? This is this is at the end of the day they won. Um, and people like Keir Starmer and Emily Thornbury and Alistair Campbell and all these people who very prominently campaigned for it knew what they were about. You know, uh, Gina Miller, who some people might know, who, who took the two major cases against the government to try and uh, around around issues related to Brexit, the prorogation of Parliament and triggering Article 50. And uh, she did an interview back in 2016, 17, where she said she was far more worried about a future Corbyn government and what that might do outside of the rules of the EU than she was about stopping Brexit. I mean, that was the reality of it. That was the real driving force behind it, especially for the sections of British capital um, that supported in terms of the deal so the reality is is that for, for british capitalists for british business um there is no deal better than staying in the european union it was the best deal for british capital because it's you know frictionless access to trade and services and no tariffs and so forth so it was the best deal by far and away so once the decision is taken to leave and once the vote is taken then you have to accept there are consequences of that so there are going to be some negative consequences of leaving how it could have been different uh, and the actual content of the deal, there are sort of elements that might have been different if Labour had negotiated it. But the real question is what the government does on the other side of it. And the thing is now, because we have a Tory government with a massive majority, they're going to do what Tories with massive majorities always do. They're going to attack workers' rights. They're going to try and roll back public services for it. They're going to marketise and commercialise where they can. Um, and they were always going to do that. I mean, this is one of the things. So we talk about workers' rights. And one of the big problems was that because Labour committed itself to this soft remain position, in the last election, we had the bizarre situation where Labour candidates were arguing that EU state aid rules were actually great and we shouldn't, we shouldn't break with them. And also that 
the rights were protected by workers' rights that were protected by the EU were the most important, and they are important, not they're not unimportant. But what that did again is it just spoke to the complete lack of understanding and belief of where these rights came from in the first place, mm-hmm. and also how you defend rights. Now, again, if you look at the EU across the board over the last 15 years, various policies that the EU has adopted at a macro level have led to the undermining of workers' rights right throughout the European Union, the downward pressure on workers' rights, not just in Greece and Ireland places where they put on concrete pressure, but right across the board through for, through competition and through forcing internal devaluation and putting companies in a position where they have to put down with pressure on workers' wages and on other benefits in order to make their exports competitive within a single market uh, zone. So the EU has been undermining workers' rights anyway. But within Britain, the single biggest attack on workers' rights here was passed in 2015-16, the Trade Union Act. And that was passed while we were in the European Union. And EU law has nothing to say about it. So the Trade Union Act was passed and has massively undermined the capacity of workers in Britain to organise and take industrial action, which is the actual core of working class power, the core of where all these rights come from. I've got friends who work in another university recently who are balloting to take absolutely essential strike action. Uh, they got 48% turnout and 78% of them voted for it, but they didn't reach the threshold. It was only 48%. And even when the CWU did hit the threshold last year or the year before, they went to the courts and had the decision overturned on a technicality in terms of how people use their postal ballots. So the Trade Union Act was the single biggest attack on workers' rights, and that was already in place. Now, the thing with the Tories is we always knew they'd attack workers' rights. There's no two ways about it. So what we should have been doing over the last five years, once the Brexit vote had happened, and this goes back to what you were saying about Labour's position, we should have been building movements, movements for workers' rights, for tenants' rights, movements for unemployed workers, anti-austerity. We should have been building those. Instead, the biggest movement, such as it was, was this campaign to overturn Brexit. You know, they were the ones who got feet, you know, feet on the streets and had those big protests and put pressure on Corbyn and that. So the deal could have been different in terms of the... Corbyn government probably would have more explicitly agreed to stronger protections of worker rights, made, maintaining the basic floor that the EU has. And, and then you'd expect that if we'd had a Corbyn government, they would have gone over and above that. They would have, you know, they had a very ambitious strategy for, for what workers' rights uh, would look like. They might have pushed back more on the formal commitments around level playing field and state aid. So the Tories have conceded lots of that. Now, the thing about the the deal that has been agreed is that, and people will, will find out this over the coming years, is that so much of it is vague and open to interpretation, and that what we'll see in the next few years is basically both sides of a test in the waters. So the, the British government will do certain things, or the German government will do certain things, and then one or the other will cry foul, and then it might go through uh, arbitration or to a decision uh, to a panel to be decided, and they'll clarify what can and can't be done. You know what I mean? So that'll all be worked out. We'll see how that shapes up. But where it would have fundamentally changed is not so much the text of the deal. And as I said, there could have been nuances. The Labour Party would have committed, I suspect, to greater environmental protections, greater protections around labour rights. Uh, they might have actually pushed back more on state aid rules, given some of the economic plans that John MacDonald and others had. They might have pushed back more on that. But fundamentally, we would have had an empowered Labour government that could have acted outside of the rigorous restraints that the EU puts on a government. And and it does do that. There's no two ways about it. Every Greek socialist has learned that in the last eight years, the last 10 years. Uh, Every sort of serious socialist in any other EU member state knows this. There's a group in Austria called ATTAC, which again, historically was quite pro-EU, but they published a report about two or three years ago called the EU Illusion. And it's chapter by chapter, all the ways in which, if you're including environmental standards, you know, the EU is very actively signing agreements with uh, Latin American countries countries and other, other countries in the world that will increase uh, CO2 emissions and will undermine attempts to, to uh, protect the climate. So anyone who understands the EU in any serious sense understands that it's fundamentally incompatible with serious socialist politics. And so what we should have been doing instead of being sucked into this rearguard action of, of sort of tamely supporting a soft remain position is building a movement that would have made demands for what a post-Brexit Britain would have looked like. It would have been a post-Brexit Britain that invested more in the NHS, a post-Brexit Britain that ideally would have abolished higher education fees, that would have uh, returned the public funding of higher education as a public good, that would have gotten rid of the, uh, the sort of the, the, the private schools that have proliferated over the last 10 years of Tory government, a whole range of things. But they could have done that without the constraints that the EU would have opposed, imposed on a socialist government. Because if, yes. if we had got a Corbyn government and that Corbyn government had gone and negotiated the deal and had stuck to its ridiculous position of holding a referendum on the deal that they had signed up to, and if Corbyn as an individual had said, 
and neutral on it, the vast majority of Labour Party MPs would have argued against the deal that Corbyn just negotiated, right? So perhaps the deal got rejected and perhaps we stayed in the EU. Uh, and if we stayed in the EU, well, then any attempt that Corbyn would have made a progressive policy, uh, a sort of regional investment banks, at, at sort of undermining uh, the privatization that's already happened in within the uh, NHS would have been attacked using EU law. There are already people lining up to do it. The lawyers firms around London were already advising clients as to how you could challenge Labour's potential uh, policies if they got elected using EU law. So that would have been the difference. We would have been outside those constraints. We could have been building going forward uh, a progressive uh, and sort of potentially radically transformative Labour movement led by the sort of Corbyn type Labour government. But, you know, that was lost as soon as Labour committed itself to the second referendum. Yes. And I think, you know, I mean, the the, the threat that the UK poses to the EU for the moment is the uh, idea of it becoming a kind of Singapore on the channel, you know, the yeah. tax haven and, 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 you know, low regulation, et cetera, that threatens the, uh, the EU's regulatory framework. I think if Corbyn had won, we would have been a threat to the EU yeah. on the basis of actually, you know, creating some kind of an example outside of the EU's borders yeah. of what could be done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and I'll admit I wasn't thinking in these terms back in 2016 because I, I voted to remain, you know, yeah. but I, I've learned more since. Um, but, you know, we would have seen the potential for real change instead of the UK being the poor man of Europe in terms of its yeah. fabric and its structure and the benefits that people receive yeah. as part of the, of the country in pensions, in, you know, unemployment, in sick pay, whatever. You know, most European countries do far better, you know, give their people far better than we do. Yeah. Uh, we would have had the chance to be dragging people up instead of dragging people down. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, but the powers that be wouldn't have liked that any, you know, particularly more than than, than the, the Tory threat to it. No, they would have liked um, it less. They would have liked we, it less, I'd say. Yeah, we touched on on the decline of Labour um, in the country and the, the problems that that's uh, posed and the attacks that have been taking place on the unions. But, mm -hmm. you know, it has to be recognised as well that sometimes the unions are the union movement's worst enemy, or yeah, at least yeah. some of them. Uh, and we saw uh, just in the last couple of days uh, the, the newly elected, you know, who squeaked through because, uh, you know, the, the, the overall left vote was bigger, but, you know, she, she got the most individual votes. Her first, as I understand it, appearance uh, on the BBC was, was spent not just, um, you know, not, not pushing the interests of the members, not calling for people to stand up and take more action to protect the rights that the Tories will be attacking, etc. But instead, this appearing to kind of try and get on the good side of a, of a right wing yeah. uh, BBC presenter and the establishment in general. Yeah. Uh, and that's been, um, you know, decried quite a lot on social media, whether, whether the wider population is aware is another question. Yeah. Um, what, you know, what do you make of the... You know, the right wing unions and the part that they've played in terms of actually hampering the labor movement. So I think it's a it's I think it's a really important question and it's it's gonna be one that's even more important going forward because and again I'm I'm not a Labour Party member, so this is the, the Labour Party members will have their own uh, issues and concerns. But in terms of the potential for a progressive project within Britain, it's not coming from Labour uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and so people are going to have to turn increasingly to trade unions and trade union activism. And um, if people haven't been doing that already, then they're going to discover all the problems that exist within the trade unions, the, the sort of um, ossified bureaucracies, bureaucracies, the politics of wanting to sort of uh, cause the least amount of disruption as possible and just sort of keep things running smoothly. But this is a long term trend. right? So the British so trade union membership in Britain has halved over the last 40 years. The number of people in unions has, has sort of not collapsed, but has declined quite steadily. And trade union militancy has declined in Britain at the same time. There's a whole set of complex historical reasons for that. But interestingly, actually, the EU plays a role in that as well. So famously, Jacques Delors uh, went to uh, the TUC and made a speech about uh, social Europe and sort of tried to win the trade unions over. And that was a pivotal turning point in the British unions and the British Labour Party embracing a, you know, a more pro-EU stance was that, was that thing. There's a Norwegian trade unionist called Ashbom Wall who's written a lot about this as a trend right across Europe. Uh, as the EU consolidated its position, most of the trade unions were co-opted. Uh, so I grew up in Ireland during the era of social partnership. And the basic idea was that unions lowered their expectations and didn't, they weren't too active. And as a result, then we'd have stable enough employment and economic growth and everybody would benefit. Now, as soon as the crash happened, eh, the bosses ditched all the social partnership rules and sort of ran off and left the workers to carry the bill as usual. 
Well, Britain didn't have a similar social uh, partnership model. There was this sort of uh, absorption of unions into the bureaucracy. So again, it's, it's no coincidence that when the Brexit vote was called, the TUC came out in favour of Remain. Because for the TUC uh, and the major unions that make up the TUC, they get the subcontract out there hard work. They say, we don't have to actually mobilise and organise and educate air trade unionists. The EU will protect their rights. It's an absolute bare minimum, but we don't have to do that. And so then they panic when that's challenged. And then there's all the sort of, yeah, the sort of stuff that goes along with that, the, the junkets to Brussels and the meals and the sort of weeks away and hotel resorts and all the conversations and all that stuff. So trade unions have been in decline for 30 plus years. So that, that hasn't changed. And the fourth thing that just struck me at the moment was that she was doing this sort of um, snivelling uh, pro pro-capital anti-worker militancy shtick with a BBC journalist who was the same one, if I remember correctly, who acted really appalled when people said that billionaires were a problem. I can't, I can't remember exactly, it was a year and a half ago. Probably, yeah. I'm the not same sure. journalist, when someone said, you know, we shouldn't have billionaires, billionaires are a problem, she was appalled, you know, all the people's hard work gets them, you know. <laughs> so for the same, because we talked to the same journalist and doing this act, now, again, it just speaks volumes. I mean, I, I think I know I had a couple of friends who are in unison and they're fantastic trade unionists and they work desperately hard to protect their rights and their, and their fellow members' rights and so forth. But unison uh, at the upper echelons has been a problem for a long time within the trade union movement. The light at the, you know, in the, in the tunnel or the silver lining in the cloud potentially is the fact that um, one of the, the left candidates, who the, the one who scored the best, a guy called Paul Holmes, yeah, is now busy organising to try to make sure that the left takes, you know, as many places as it can on the on the unison unis national executive yeah. to try to you know limit the extent to which the union can be dragged to the right and, yeah. and set the base for something better going forward. And yeah. I think the key in that you know in that instance is to react by organising and fighting harder, not by yeah. walking away from the fight. But that leads us into your. Um, you know, one of your key areas of interest, which is political education, because people yeah. need to, you know, if people get their news fix from the six o'clock BBC broadcast, or they get their union news from the official newsletter that comes out or something, they're not going to be very well informed as to what's actually going on within the given, you know, within their particular environment that affects them. Yeah. But if people can be educated as to what's going on and understand better what's being, what's happening and what's being done to them, then obviously we've got a better chance to organise and fight back against it. So you're involved in this political education project. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll finish out our, our little session now by just letting you tell us about that and, and what you hope to achieve with it. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks very much. So, yeah, just to say again, you, you've sort of hit the nail on the head there in terms of within the unions, the challenge now is the fight. And again, that was the challenge before in unison. It was the challenge before McInee won the position. And in all of the other unions, it is the challenge. Uh, but again, it's how we think about trade unions, you know, and again, that's that's a political education question. You know, do people think of the trade union as a service provider, as someone that sort of gives them, you know, uh, discounts on insurance from certain companies and stuff like that? Or do they see the union as something that they're actively involved in at a grassroots level? And that's the key is, is workers being organized in every workplace at a grassroots level. And there are some unions that do this. The IWGB does very good work. They're still a quite a small union, but they give a good example of what we can do. And they've won important victories with uh, um, cleaners in London and elsewhere so there are sort of green shoots and then the NEU over the last 15 20 years hasn't been great but in the current pandemic the NEU has been excellent and the NEU showed us all by putting the foot down on not sending their members back uh, when the government was going to reopen schools and that possibly saved lives but it also showed the power of the trade union and the power of workers if we organize in terms of political education, so I've, I've been involved in helping to set up uh, the political education project, which people can find on, on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, and the basic idea behind it is, is that when Corbyn and everybody was in, was in power and labour, a massive failure on their part was the education thing. So we go back to talking about the EU, right? And, and I think it is true. Uh, I think the evidence shows that most Labour Party members, when they were polled, were Remain voters. But there was no effort at any point within the Labour Party to have serious discussions and debate about the nature of the European Union. So to actually push people on the question of, well, why do you want to remain in the European Union? Do you think it's a peace project? It's not. Do you think it's a human rights project? It's not. Do you think it's something that we can develop socialism within a fundamental reform? We can't. You know? So there was no actual attempt at it. That was never articulated. But again, that's not the responsibility of the Labour Party. 
historically in Britain, uh, there have always been uh, working class grassroots political education initiatives. So whether that was workers institutes, whether it was socialist Sunday schools, whether it was the miners libraries in Wales and elsewhere, the working class have always understood the importance of education in general and political education specifically. And that's been lost over the last 40 years. I mentioned about the unions declining. We, we were beaten as a class. We were beaten when the miners were beaten. We've been on the back foot ever since then. And many of the institutions of working class organisation uh, in Britain have, have fallen by the wayside. So when Corbyn did come in, there were a lot of really enthusiastic people brought into the movement. But there's a whole range of things that people need to understand when they're engaged in politics about the nature of state power, the nature of capitalism, the nature of the EU, the nature of the media and ideology, how these things operate, even what is socialism. There's a group of Labour MPs um, who, who were mainly sort of a campaigning for a Remain position and believed themselves to be socialists in that regard. And they launched this project called Love Socialism. And I jokingly said to a friend of mine, well, before I declared that I loved somebody, I'd want to get to know them first. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so this sort of Love Socialism thing is from a group of people whose socialism I don't recognize. To me, that's mm. not socialism, it's liberalism. It's a, it's a certain type of liberalism that they're interested in. And that's fine. That's an honourable tradition. So there are questions for us then. What is socialism? Uh, what's the relationship of working class organisations to fight anti-racism? What about the question of women's oppression? How do we build working class power? How do, what about capitalist crisis? Where did it come from? What can we do about it? So all of these different questions are really important ones. So we're starting off this project because we think that whatever happens next, whether it's in the Labour Party, outside it, through the trade unions, or if it's something entirely new, if something comes along that none of us quite anticipated, we think that we'll be far better off if we've put in place beforehand layers of working class activists that feel empowered, that are linked up with each other and feel they've got a better grasp of what's going on. So some of like the project, what you guys are engaged in in terms of uh, building an alternative media that genuinely speaks to and, and sort of engage with working class people, we're trying to do something like that. So we start with a 10 week course uh, and because of COVID and because of the lockdown, we're doing it all online to begin with. And so um, the first course starts on the 4th of February and we're going to cover five topics. So for two weeks, we'll do a topic and we'll cover five of them in the 10 weeks. And then that first uh, day, the 4th of February, we'll drop a video which gives people a brief introduction and then we'll put up two things that we're asking people to read. And so the video will be about what is socialism. Now, it won't be us saying this is what socialism is. It'll be us asking the question, what's socialism? <clears throat> so again, I won't put you on the spot and say, what do you think socialism is? But do think <laughs> about it. And anybody who's watching this, think about it. Like, take a minute, because we're all fighting for socialism. But what yeah. do we mean? What do we understand that to be? Like, if we got a Labour government in and they took over most of the factories and most of the main, major businesses and the railways, but we were all still having to go out and walk for a wage and we didn't have a say in it. It was somebody else. It was some sort of, you know, well-intentioned middle-class economist making the decisions for us. Would that be socialism or would it be something else? You know, so we're going to ask people that question. And then two weeks after that, so we put the stuff out on the 4th of February, two weeks after that, starting on the 14th of February, we're going to be hosting live socialist Sunday schools. Uh, so again, all the information will be up on our website, but we'll have a, a sort of um, a lead off where we'll have a couple of trade unionists and community activists who will speak for about 20 minutes, talk about the readings and the ideas, and then we'll open up to everyone else. It was never been done before, so there's going to be a bit of learning by doing the technical Sounds side. brilliant. I guess it's not going to, by, when you say Sunday school, it's not what most people would think of as a no, Sunday school with a bunch of kids sitting on a mat, uh, exactly. no. singing, singing <laughs> hymns or whatever. But, no, um, no, no, it's going to be... Yeah, um, it, sounds, it sounds really interesting. So will you quickly, I mean, I'll, I'll stick this information up on the screen as well yeah, for brilliant. people to read, but tell, tell us briefly where people will find that. What do yeah. they what do they have to do? Does it you know if it costs what does it cost? Etc. No, no, so it doesn't can, cost anything. It's free. We can um, we can uh, get people pointed in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. So it's you, you'll find us if you search um, on Twitter or on Facebook for the Political Education Project, you'll find it. And there's a website called politicaleducationproject.org. Uh, the thing is completely free. Uh, it's voluntary. All of us who who are involved setting it up are doing it voluntary. But our ultimate aim as well is that everybody who participates in it will own it. I mean, everybody who participates in it will be the ones who decide fundamentally the directions that it takes. So we've, we've started it. We've kicked it off, right? And, and sort of we'll bring a certain... Because I've taught for um, 12 years now in universities and stuff like that. So I've got a certain experience and other people do as well. I've been involved in trade unions and in, in, in community uh, activism and everything else. So we bring a certain experience at the start but we're adopting what's called a sort of Frarian approach. I don't know if you ever read Paolo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, but the right. whole idea is, is that the working class 
already know the answers to the problems that we face, but we have to walk through them collectively and get ourselves to that point. And again, that's that's what the whole project is about. The project is free, there's no charges. The only thing is, is we'll be asking people, and for some people this will be new, and, and some people might have left school a long time ago, whatever. We're asking people to do the reading if they can. If you can't, mm -hmm. still come to the Sunday schools, but the reading is important. I mean, you mentioned trade unions earlier. I'm sure you know Mother Jones, who was a, an Irish immigrant in America in the early 20th century, and she was once called the most dangerous woman in the world in America because mm -hmm. of her sort of militant trade unionism. But she said to a group one, she said, sit down and read and prepare yourself for the fights ahead. And this is the thing there, right? After the Corbyn defeat, after Starmer and those have sort of successfully retaken the Labour Party and are completely obliterating the sort of minor gains that the left made within Labour, with the crisis we're facing now, a Tory party that will be on the front foot, attacking workers' rights, with the economic uh, depression that we're entering, with the climate crisis, with all of these things in it, as a class, we have to learn the lessons of the last few years. Otherwise, we just run, rush headlong into more defeats. We rush headlong into more mistakes. So we have to learn the lessons. I mean, I'll give a very brief example just at the end of it. You know, people watching it and yourself might be familiar with what happened in Bolivia in the last year and a bit. So the Bolivian government was overthrown by a US and, and EU backed right wing coup where he overthrew a socialist indigenous leader. He was forced to flee the country. Now, if you know the history of Latin America, you know that that's a horribly familiar script. Mm -hmm. A right wing coup overthrows a left wing government and usually leads to absolute carnage for working class people. Now, they did this right wing coup. They murdered trade unionists. They murdered socialists. It looked at the movement on the back foot. But less than a year later, the movement bounced back won the majority in all the elections in the country. Morales is back in the country. The coup leaders are on the run. The whole thing has been overthrown. Now, they, long before the MAS, the movement towards socialism, which is Morales' party, long before they were a political party, they were a social movement of indigenous and working class people, trade unionists and activists, who had been doing political education as a key part of what they did from the start. So when they were, when they were attacked, and it was a serious attack, they didn't just wither and vanish. They had strong foundations in working class communities, had, were politically educated, well organised, and they bounced back. So going forward for us in Britain and Ireland and elsewhere, we need to be empowering working class people because the scale of the crisis we face is, is like nothing any of us has seen before. And the only people who can actually find a way out of this is an organised working class. So we hope with the Political Education Project that we'll make a small contribution to help and to sort of um, support and prepare people to engage in those struggles going forward. Yes. I, I couldn't agree more. I think I'll be, uh, if I can find the sound to do the reading, I'll be signing up for sure to do this uh, yeah. <laughs> to do this course as well. And I think it's definitely something that we should be looking to put out on uh, on socialist telly as well for people. Brilliant. Um, I just want to finish off, and I mean, thank you for that. It's, it's been a brilliant contribution. Um, you mentioned about, uh, you know, the unions and you mentioned the IWGB. Mm -hmm. um, it made me think of a, a thread I read on Twitter this morning by uh, a young guy called Kane Shaw. Mm -hmm. and uh, he was talking about the, the unison situation. He said, uh, imagine you made the, the new General Secretary of Britain's largest union and your first media appearance, rather than address workers and call for greater industrial militancy, you spend your time taking pot shots at other unions to impress a BBC hack, yeah. big business and the government. But as he follows on with that and he said, if the likes of Econ Union, UVW Union and the IWGB Union yeah. uh, had the money in the membership of Unison would be looking at a totally different political and industrial landscape in this country. Yeah. And I think that's the, you know, that's the, the, the real situation. You know, the, sadly the, the unions, you know, those unions are quite small, yeah. uh, growing as I understand it as well. But you yeah. know, imagine if we had, you know, the biggest union in the UK and the biggest union in the UK and Ireland, which is yeah. Unite, were both being run by people with a genuine intent to change the country for the better for working people. Yeah. what we would be, you know, what kind of a, a, a power we'd have, regardless of what was happening on the parliamentary level. Yeah. And I think that's where the political education issue becomes so critical because, you know, the reason that we don't have people, you know, we don't have that across the board in the union movement yeah. is because, you know, people are, people are not to play the system, get into positions yeah, yeah. Uh, instead of, the, you know, because people aren't well enough educated to see what's going on and, and demand that it be done right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I completely endorse that project. I hope it succeeds, and uh, I'll be doing whatever, whatever I can to uh, and socialist telly will, I'm sure, uh, to help make sure that that succeeds because it's, it's vital much. to the future of working class people in this country.
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. And again, the, that thread that came that you mentioned there, I didn't see it, but I agree with it. And again, the thing about the political education element, where that comes in is also trying to help people understand why unions are the way they are and also understand what we need to do to make a difference. And again, also, it all comes back then to as well to the understanding of the work. James Connolly, who was Scottish, obviously died in Ireland, uh, part of the Easter Rising and a key working class revolutionary in Ireland. As he once said, there's none so fitted to break the chains as those who wear them. And mm -hmm. so the political education project and grassroots trade unionism, like with the IWGB and others doing, but also there are fantastic people in Unite and Unison and all the existing unions. But then there are structural forces that mean those unions operate in the way they do it. And we need to understand that and then build a force that's capable of transforming that. And that is the collective project for all of us going forward. And again, you mentioned earlier about labor, whether people stay or leave, well, that's again, people are, and then I mean, this in the nicest way, people are old enough to understand what they're gonna do there. People have made their minds up about that. But the real fights for us as a class are transforming these things, getting, getting right to political education, getting right to union organizing. And then we can really talk about changing things. And again, it's, you know, time's always up against us. <laughs>